Yes, we're talking AI. No, no, we're talking uh, social media and a bunch of other stuff, not just AI. Uh, oh, James is here. James would love the story I just told, which is, uh, you know, cloning yourself using chat GPT-4 and then querying yourself on opportunities in the marketplace. That was fun. Uh, I, I was going to show my actual screen, but I actually input a bunch of personal data into it. So I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I'll I'll make a template version of it that you guys can use if you want. Uh, but today we have Dustin. Dustin is our uh, head of marketing over here at uh, Digital Marketer. So I figured today we could talk about developments in social media, uh, paid media, and actually just those two topics alone would probably cover uh, the entire time. Uh, but Dustin, why don't we do a little intro to you? What uh, what have you done so far in your life? Oh, man. Um, <laughs> is starting from like the canal and, and entering the world? Or <laughs> how far we'll back? go a little later than that. Let's go <laughs> the last 10 years. <laughs> All right. That sounds good. Uh, last 10 years. Okay. So, um, well, right now, as you know, and said, I'm the head of marketing over here at Digital Marketer. Um, I've been working with the the scalable family of companies for uh, about about a year and a half, almost two years now. Highly and then, successful there. <laughs> yeah, it's uh it's been cool. Uh, it's been cool working with uh, all you guys. But well, I'll I'll save that for later. I'll uh, not be too sappy. But anyway, the uh, going going back like six seven years, I had started a uh, an e commerce marketing agency, and so I ran that for almost seven years. And then um, it still lives on. I just don't have to actively run it every day. Um, so there's pe people that help me run it. And then I don't, you know, of course it's not the same capacity, but it's to let, let that live on. Um, but yeah, so a lot of e-commerce stuff. Um, the few years before that, I was doing a lot of um, marketing consulting for uh, fitness influencers and helping them stand up their businesses and leverage their social media accounts to actually create real businesses. Um, Cause that's the thing I feel like is, is interesting in, in this kind of new, this new era of um, kind of everyone being a, a micro influencer on some level, whether it's with your friends or, um, or uh, just peers, people, you know, or you do have a substantial following online, but even if you have a thousand followers, there's stuff you can do to actually stand up a real business out of that. Um, so I spent a lot of, a lot of uh, like th two, three years helping, helping influencers back in like 2016, 2015, stand up businesses using their uh, accounts and grow that way. So forwarding to today, working on digital marketer stuff and um, yeah, doing a lot of, a lot of paid media, a lot of email marketing, a lot of social um, and just uh, doing my best to keep the machine running over here. Nice. Well, there's plenty to do. Uh, I know. <laughs> uh, well, that, that's awesome. That your background, it's actually kind of similar to mine in terms of the, the fitness component, because you're totally right. I used to work with, you know, I was always on content. So I'd collect content from people and some of the people I work with would have like 400,000 followers on say Instagram and they would have zero income. They'd just be like, yeah, it's interesting. Like everyone by. thinks they're like rolling in it, but it's a different skill set. Well, and, and I think following somebody is different from giving somebody money, you know, because I think the the trick is that you could have one person could follow thousands of people. And it doesn't mean that they're actually giving thousands of people money. That's a that's a totally right. different relationship. So how did you kind of take somebody who had like, say, a decent following, say, like five, 10,000 people and start to monetize that? So a lot of it was um was siphoning as much of the audience from social over to email and then using email automations. Um, and of course, you know, that it starts with, do you have something to sell? Um, so typically it's, you know, whatever, whatever you're following is built around building some kind of business around that. Usually something, some kind of online course or online program is the fastest way or a service is the fastest way to get, to get rolling. Um, so that's what, that's what I would do with them is help them kind of create fitness programs and then, um, and then use the storyboarding just like you would, just like you would in email marketing, like storyboarding a, a series of, of emails. And we would take that same copy, go over to their Instagram or wherever they had the following and just do a, a post a day, um, storyboarding out a, a launch basically where they're talking about, um, you know, they're poking people's problems, people's issues with their fitness and whatever their, their, uh, program was going to solve for them and just kind of breaking those barriers down one day at a time. And then, um, getting people to go over to their email list and join their email list for some kind of lead magnet freebie that was related to their program. 
um, and then start a launch sequence over there. And it was a really, it was a really seamless way for them to sell on social without it feeling like they're always selling on social. Cause really what it mm-hmm. felt like is they were just being helpful and teaching because they were, um, so a lot of, and you can definitely sell on social, but like a lot of what we do at digital marketer here with our social is we, we do very little, uh, selling via social, but we do a lot of, um, helpful teaching and sending people to lead magnets. And then we let our email automations do the work. Yeah. I think that's, that's always the best approach that I've seen in terms of, uh, if you don't have something that's just blatantly being sold, like I, I work with a lot of fitness manufacturers. And so the product was the product here, use the product. Right. Uh, but there's still a way to do that. Cause I, I work with a company called kettlebell Kings before. And if you look at their social, it is very, uh, informational. Like they're not saying buy kettlebells. It's like, Oh, here's a workout. Here's an exercise. Here's, you know, people in a group training area and, you know, just application, which I think is a good awareness. Um, right. Type of. right. Mm-hmm. So actually we do have the social media cert, uh, coming out, uh, very soon. Yep. Uh, so, and I think that's what we try to push in there is the leads and conversions. Um, have you seen, so the mm-hmm. lead side would of course be the lead magnets, but the conversion side of that kind of intro product, um, did you have any methodologies for, uh, kind of promoting that subtly? Like on social, you mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, not shying away from saying like, you know, because of, because of these problems that I've had in my life and many of my clients have had, um, I'm creating this program and it's launching in a week or whatever the cadence was. So definitely letting people know it's there. It's just, um, you know, a really fast way to kill your following is to be selling to people all day. And so, um, and it's not like email where you can segment, you know, Mm. you, when you post on social, you're posting to everybody. So taking, taking the approach of um, informing and educating and then, um, and then helping with a free thing, to, to get the audience back. Um, another really cool tactic that worked, uh, it still works. I mean, we, we just did this at, at DM recently, um, about a month ago. Um, and it still works really, really well. If you have a, if you have a following of, I mean, it doesn't have to have to be that bad, that big. It can be, you can have a thousand people. Um, and you want to grow your following or grow your email list. The two, they're like, one of the easiest things to do is a, a partnership giveaway where you're partnering with other brands and you're all uh, dishing in something to give away um, and then collecting leads. Like I, I like to use, there's a couple of things we use. We use gleam gleam.io for that is one. And then um, if you're just doing a smaller scale one, King sumo is a good tool, really easy. There's not a lot of customization, but you can get it up in five minutes, which is nice. So if you're not a designer or something, it's, it makes it real easy. Um, but essentially what you do is instead of just, doing a giveaway to your own audience where like, yeah, you might be able to get some people from your Instagram or your TikTok over to your email list. Um, but if you partner with someone who is a, a similar brand or has a similar audience, but they're not a competitor mm. and then get them to also promote. And then you can either, I mean, a lot of times, honestly, like you don't even have to do a lead share. That's a lot of people's concern with doing some kind of partnership giveaways. You have to give all your leads away um, mm. and kind of you know, more or less sell your audience to another company to help Hope you. that they don't you annoy them. <laughs> yeah. And you totally don't have to do that. So, um, so what I would do is, is do, um, if, especially if you have a smaller audience, try to partner with at least two other brands that are a little bit bigger than you and leverage them against each other. So again, you, you all, none of you can be competitors, but if you say, Hey, we're doing a, we're doing a big giveaway to sell this fitness program, but we're, we're going to be giving away all this, um, like, all these different, um, like I'm going to give away a program. We're going to give away some, uh, some bands. We're going to give away some dumbbells, some kettlebells, and you're partnering with other strategic brands. Um, even if you have a thousand followers and someone who has 10,000 would be like, I don't want to partner with you because I'm not going to get the good end of that deal. That's why you need at least two other partners because you say, and, and you start with the first one and you say, if I get buy-in from another similar size brand, would you be interested? They almost always say yes. And then you go to the other one and you say, they're in, do you want in too? They have a big following. And then, so you could see how you become kind of a, a mediator between these three or more brands. Um, 
And then, you know, your, what you're contributing is you're setting it up, you're building the landing page or the, you know, setting up the giveaway, you're facilitating. And then at the end of the giveaway, you send an email out to everyone who did not win. You say, we chosen the winner. You didn't win, but you know, you're still a winner. And then you have your other brands that you partnered with put a special deal in and has to actually be a good deal, but give everyone a special deal, whether it's a you know, if it's a physical product, you could do like a big old coupon, like 40% off or something, or if it's a software, give them a extended, you know, a 90 day trial, like something you wouldn't normally do, um, to actually reward them for participating. Um, and then everyone's happy. You don't have to give the leads to everybody, but you just grew your email list a lot. You just grew your social following a lot because of all the promotion. Um, so we would do that all the time with, with influencers to help them build, build up a bigger following and then launch. And we would get, you know, back to back six figure launches with that stuff. Wow. That's amazing. Now for the, uh, what would be the cadence of that? Is something you do like quarterly or is it annually or. I would always do it quarterly. Um, you, you might be able to do it more often. The, the, the stress of doing it more often though, is that your, uh, audience starts to just feel like all you're doing is promoting giveaways. And eventually that does feel a little spammy. So mm. quarterly is a pretty good cadence. That's what we do at DM. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I think 90 days, that's kind of the uh, the default. Well, definitely for what we do at DM. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I think I used to tell people, well, in fitness, I'd always say like, you should have an event, not necessarily a promo, but you should have some type of event coming up every month just so you could talk about the event, which I think is a yeah. good you know, uh, hack for any business. that's like, well, I, I want to seem active. It's like, oh, well, just say you're doing a webinar on the subject you always talk about. And then yeah, do the webinar once a month. <laughs> you, you inevitably catch people who just weren't paying attention last time, or they're new to your list, or they're new to following you. Um, so yeah, like having, and, and people often feel like they have to reinvent the wheel and do like a fresh webinar every time in that scenario. You don't, you can do the same exact one. You can even do the same one, but but pitch it differently and you're going to capture a different segment of your audience that maybe wasn't interested last time, but with a different headline, now they're really interested. Oh, that makes sense. Uh, that's, that's really smart. And I think, you know, even with all the changes coming to everything, uh, that kind of tactic will still definitely work. And then also uh, just the niche, because, you know, when you're talking about those, those lower counts, um, as long as they're niche and they're very specific, they could still really deliver. Um, mm-hmm. How did you convince people to actually have a niche? Because that's always been a pain in the butt. Yeah, that's <laughs> a good question. Because um, I think there's a, oh, there we go. I don't know if that was me or not, but hello. Um, that was glitching there. But um, yeah, so p- getting to pick a niche, I think it, it was a struggle, um, especially when a lot of these people had decently large followings already. They felt like they were ignoring part of their audience if they made something that wasn't extremely broad. Um, I think the trap is thinking that that if you put yourself in a box, you're going to um, miss out on sales opportunities by having something available for everyone. When in reality, if you if you don't put yourself in a box, other people will put you in a box for you. And they're going to put you in a box that they made up for you. Um, that isn't necessarily true. And they're not going to buy from you because they just put you in a different box than the one you didn't put yourself in. So the best way to sell things is to niche down, put yourself in a box, talk around a specific topic for a specific audience. Um, you can always expand later, but when you're selling, when you're selling something specific, put yourself in a specific box so that when the person sees it, the first thing they think is this is absolutely for me. If they question at all, is this for me? They don't buy. People don't buy when they're confused. They buy when they're certain. So let's give them certainty by niching down. So that was a lot of the, the strategy of, uh, for the, the fitness people is just like, or just influencers in general. But I mean, th- this applies to businesses too. It's not even just influencers. It's, it's like, whatever you're selling, start small. I, I always tell people, try to own a pond before you attack the ocean, mm-hmm. right? If you can, if you try to play in the ocean when you're too small of a brand or you're new to a market, um, you're going to get eaten up because that's where sharks swim, right? If you go back and just try to own a pond, you can be a big fish in a small pond real quick. And that is very lucrative. You can get a lot of revenue out of a small pond and that's what niching is. From there, you start to expand, right? And you start you start kind of build, going to other ponds and eventually you combine them and you got you got something big. But you grow best by attacking one thing at a time. 
Oh, that's genius. Well, I love the concept of, you know, like, oh, I don't want to be in a box. And then you tell them you are in a box. You just didn't decide which one. <laughs> right. Because that, that is what happens. But I always tell people too, it's not just for, of course, uh, prospecting makes it a lot easier, but also referrals because, you know, in marketing, we're oh, all yeah. about referrals. And if you can't, if I don't know that somebody is a specialist in whatever, maybe I have a referral for, I'm not going to send them to you because that'd yeah. be dangerous for me. Right. Yeah. I, I need you to be a specialist. <laughs> that is a really good point. Like, um, yeah, because I, I mean, a lot of especially service businesses grow, uh, most grow exclusively by referrals. Um, and even social is um, used as not necessarily a lead generation platform, but as an engagement platform, right? When you kind of have people in your ecosystem where they're deciding whether they're going to buy or not, they go to your your foyer, which is your social, your social mm -hmm. uh, sites. Um, but the, um, I'm losing my train of thought. What was I talking about? <laughs> we were talking about referrals and- I was going to uh, try to uh, save niche. it, but- <laughs> yeah. Refer oh yeah. Right. I do referrals. That time. I don't <laughs> <laughs> Let my brain catch up. Um, yeah. Referrals. The um, yeah. The, if you're, if you're not specific, then, then people don't refer. And this is what you said. And I totally yeah. agree because if you accidentally refer one of your friends or, or a client to someone else and it doesn't go well, it doesn't look just poorly on that company. It looks poorly on you. So yes. the, the best referrals come from you niching yourself down. And I think, something that helps me mentally in that, um, in that space is you're not going to, you're going to get more business. And remember, you can always sell people on other things later. Once they're, once they're already a client, once they're in your ecosystem, you can resell them other things that aren't your, you know, your public quote unquote niche. Um, so if you say like, so my agency was an e-commerce or e-commerce email marketing and an SMS agency. Um, but all the time we would sell SEO, we would sell uh, web development on the back end, but that's not publicly what we said we did. And that helped us establish a niche to get those referrals um, and also being able to prove with real testimonials, real, um, real snapshots of client accounts showing like this was the growth month over month for this client. This is the ROI for this client. And just keeping it really focused on that one thing on email marketing made it really easy for us to, to get really high quality referrals because people could trust it. And they weren't worried that we were going to take their referral bomb and then that client <laughs> would leave them too. Yeah. Or, or it's, you know, it is just a friend of yours and then it, it hurts your reputation because then they're like, oh, well, you sent me over here to this person. Like, are you just trying to get rid of me? Like, why would you send me here? Like I've had, I've had issues in the past. And I'm like, no, I just don't want to work with you. <laughs> <laughs> you don't tell them that, but you say, oh, let me try somebody else. But, but yeah, it, it needs to go well. And that's why the, the referral business is not as easy as it seems just because a lot of people default to it because it, falls in your lap but uh you could definitely mess it up and i think the having that niche and and being a professional and whatever you say your niche is is good too uh now fitness yeah. you can just make it up for the most part <laughs> because everybody <laughs> knows the same stuff uh but it applies to all businesses which i love uh now for social media we do have the uh tiktok stuff right now where uh congress is talking about ban or no biden administration is talking about banning tiktok uh, what's mm -hmm. your feelings on that? Do you think it's going to get banned? What do you think will happen if it does? I think I, th I see one of two things happening, at least in the in, in United States. I see one option where um, the United States bans it to make a point um, and to, to make an example out of them. And, and frankly, just because of a, of a um, China feud that's going on. I mean, I, I think it's kind of political if they do that. Um, I, I think that's the least likely thing that's going to happen. I think what's just just because TikTok accounts for such a large a part of our economy, like the I mean, it is a it's a commerce machine. The amount of money that comes from people buying things through TikTok, um, it will it will absolutely affect the economy negatively in the United States if they ban it. So I think when we're in an already tough economic time, I don't see them making the, the call to ban it outright. I think they're just going to work with them very closely to regulate as much as they can um, and and move on. That's what I think is going to happen, but I, I could see it happening either way, but that would be my prediction. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I was with you where it was kind of like, I don't think they'll do it just because there's so much money involved and it, it is, you know, an American company technically owns the piece that is part of 
you know, TikTok. Mm -hmm. And so, so it's already kind of regulated, but the whole, my whole thing with, they kept talking about privacy, like, oh, they're stealing your data. It's like Facebook has been doing that since the beginning. Their whole business model was to sell the information to <laughs> other countries. So if it's about privacy, it's like we we gave up on that like a long time ago. And now it seems more like uh, Facebook and Instagram isn't doing as well as TikTok. And maybe that's the reason why that this is now getting pushed through because of uh, you know connections within that side. And it has nothing to do with. It's all political. Nothing. Yeah, none of it. None of it's for the reasons that they say. Um, my my hope as a marketer is that. Um, I mean, and also I think if it did happen, it's going to take a while. So like I'm. I guess what I'm saying is, from a marketing perspective, I'm not over here worried about pulling budget right now. I'm mm -hmm. like, if anything, it's probably a better time to double down. Um, typically, if you can zag when other people are zigging, you get better results. Yeah, well, and I think what they've done, if nothing else, I think the TikTok has really upped, you know, the content on all platforms because it's uh, so addictive. You know, I think the average user spends 90 minutes a day on TikTok, which nobody else can claim. And if you just go through your feeds, because I'm always going back and forth between Facebook and uh, Instagram and LinkedIn and all these different places, like the only one I actually enjoy going into is like, you know, TikTok, like, oh, yay, here's somebody making a chair and then here's <laughs> an update on AI. And then here's, and it is, it's like probably 75% of the posts, like I would actually watch, which is incredible. You could scroll on Facebook for years <laughs> and not find right. that much good, day. but it has gotten better. I have noticed that the video, the short form videos on Facebook have actually improved quite a bit. And then the, uh, the news feed, uh, which I look at quite a bit, but then I'm like, you know, who knows what that means? <laughs> that can I'm so sick day of, real quick. Oh, I, well, I'm so sick of clicking on links and it being like you read a little bit of the article and then you realize that you're on like the Atlantic or you're on, uh, you know, Wall Street Journal and then it just cuts you off and you're like, oh, this. <laughs> I hate the trials. I hate the. I the hate trials. the like. You have three articles left. It annoys me so much. Uh, well, the know, amount of times I've bought like a one dollar trial just to finish a thing and then I cancel it. It's so annoying. <laughs> pain in the butt but show me I an ad I, just show me an ad it's I know. It's just just advertise like just hyperlink everything i don't care uh but no i do think that's that's a sign of what is coming because i keep on talking about privatizing your following because you know who knows what's going to happen with seo and and these other components so if you aren't building your email list or if you aren't building your community then you might be in trouble in the near future because oh yeah God, yeah the whole seo game who knows what's going to happen there yeah, I think there's a lot that will unfold over the next three to five years in SEO. Um, but yeah, I, and I think, and, and you and I have talked about this, um, you know, out, outside of, you know, privately before, I think, and I think you're right that community building is really important. And that's where social thrives. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, Mich and Michelle gets a, gets a fist bump. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, Whoever's there should get a raise. <laughs> yeah. And, and I mean, I think it's going to be really critical because people won't make as many buying decisions um, based on how well you position yourself in, in Google or Bing. And it'll be more based on, do they um, feel a sense of belonging to your community and to your product? Uh, and that is a superpower of social is, is making people rally around something or whether it's for it or against it, people get strong opinions and they find their, their uh, crews to rally around things they care about. Um, and so that's why, I mean, I feel like social is just going to get more important. Community building is going to get more important. Um, and I think we're seeing with all the uh, AI tools getting better and better. Um, the content, the amount of content is getting more. And I think eventually the, you know, we're going to hit an arc of too much mediocre content created by a robot and need to have um, a correction of quality versus quantity, but smart marketers are going to be doing that already and, mm -hmm. and uh, kind of doing a hybrid model of AI helped me make this. And then me, the human the marketer, I'm going to go make it great. Um, and so as we're pushing more of that out to social, like, you know, we we're talking about the social nucleus model, mm -hmm. um, you know, yesterday, the day before, where like, which I know is in the challenge coming up, the social media challenge, you're going to be teaching all through that. So I won't, mm -hmm. um, I won't give too much away, but, um, but just that model of like, you can, you can create one great piece of video content that is perfectly aligned and strategic, and then goes to all these other platforms 
Um, and AI has made it so fast that where, you know, the pain in the butt before for years was like taking, taking like your video and then trying to go into like iMovie and figure out how to chop it up and then like put it into another app to get captions and they never auto generate correctly. And then like you spent 45 minutes to make an Instagram post and then you're like, okay, the other 19 posts have to wait. Cause I got to get back to work. So like, I'm, I mean, the other day I, I spent about I uploaded a I uploaded a 45 minute podcast video and it made me it made me 10 pieces of content in about 30 minutes that were auto captioned perfectly. Um, they put they were different sizes. They even like it was recorded as a Zoom call. So we were side to side. It even stacked them on top of each other for me without mm -hmm. me asking uh, to make uh, videos for TikTok and Instagram. And it was within in 30, 40 minutes. It was all done. Nine pieces of content. It was incredible. Uh, so I think we're going to see social media content uh, quality and eventually quantity shoot up a lot. Um, so a lot of a lot of marketers who have been a little bit on the sidelines with social, um, I would suggest getting getting going. Um, bu build your tribe. It's going to be that one thing that's your moat. The reason people buy from you over anyone else is because they're going to believe they belong to your community and they trust what you have to say. So it it can't hurt you, especially if you can make nine posts in 30 minutes. No, no more uh, reasons no not excuse. to. Yeah, well, I think you're totally right. And even for me, you know, I, I consider myself a writer and sometimes I won't post because I'm like, crap, I got to write and then I got to figure out the hashtags and I got to do all these steps and then I just don't do it. So I think AI, if nothing else, will take all the people who weren't doing anything and finally make them present on social media maybe not good at social media but i yeah, I there, yeah told, there's more tactical than just posting yeah. right like but yeah but but still just to be you exist and i think for a lot of people if if they are interested in your company and they check out your facebook and you haven't posted since like 2018 or something and they're gonna be like oh this company's not in business anymore i guess i won't work with them and so i think it's <laughs> And that's totally different than what, how it was before. It was kind of like content before where it was like, oh, I, I know I should be on Instagram, but I'm not and whatever. I still am making money. And now it's like, eh, I don't know if you will anymore because people expect that. You know, people who like Twitter want you to tweet. People who like Instagram want you to post pictures and reels. People who like LinkedIn expect your company updates. And if you aren't doing everything, then you're probably missing out on at least a percentage of the business, right? Yeah. I mean, I think like the way I approach it at least is, um, the more, the more platforms you can be excellent on the better. If you're currently excellent on none of them, get excellent on one or two. Um, and then you're going to learn a lot about human psychology through that process and about marketing in general, what actually gets results, um, on social. And then you can apply that to the other platforms. But part of that too, is not knowing what platform is actually strategic for you. Um, and I think we, as marketers, we have to be careful with personal bias because I might like Instagram the best, but my business might not be uh, aligned for that. It, LinkedIn might be a much better. And if I'm going to pick one, I need to pick the one that I think is going to actually get me the best community for my business um, and start there. Because then you can always, I mean, it's just like building a big email list. You can always leverage it to push it to other platforms. So if you end up with a couple thousand followers on LinkedIn and now you want to start Twitter, great. Tell everyone on your LinkedIn to go also follow you on Twitter. And chances are half of them are already there. Uh, and it just made it a lot easier to, to leverage against yourself and, and grow your following a lot faster across platforms instead of trying to do six or seven platforms at once and you suck at all of them and you're running out of time and then you get no following and then you feel like a failure and, and uh, the spiral continues. Yeah. Then you start over again next quarter or next year. Yeah. Yeah. When you, you get know, inspired this, again. This year, I'm going to be great. And I think we've all said that before. Like, I'm going to get serious this year about whatever. But that, that's genius is, is just picking one to be good at. And then you go splinter that content into whatever else you want. But yep. at least you're good at one. And I think that is something we're trying to teach with the social cert, where it's like, hey, we're going to teach you seven platforms. But at the beginning, we say, you got to pick one, maybe two, like a support platform where it's, you know, some of them go together well. Like you said, LinkedIn and Twitter is one that um, I think both Mandy and uh, Goldie talked about where it's like these two go well together because they're, you know, text based and you could just right. ping back and forth. So I think that's uh, that's huge. And I, and like I said, <laughs> what's terrible, too, is that marketers specifically don't usually have a good social media presence because 
I actually looked yeah. up, we were doing research for the biggest marketing firms in the world. And I'm like, oh, well, let's see what they do on social. And most of them have no social presence or they have like maybe hundred million dollar marketing firms have like no posts on LinkedIn. And I'm like, what? Like, how did, how do you qualify yep. this? But they have their funnels <laughs> set up. So maybe they don't have to, but I still think that's going to shift. <laughs> Yeah, like how they how they make and and that's well that's an interesting point too. I think there's conversation to be had about B two B versus B two C and how you use social. Um, I know, and and some people are and, and like kind of just knowing your strengths too, right? Like so, like if you're a if you're a bank, you don't need to use social, right? People just well maybe now. If you're a <laughs> bad example, if you're a if you're a grocery store. You probably don't need to like actively be used, like trying to post entertaining TikToks. Like, I don't think it's going to increase the amount of people that come to your store. Um, like, that's not how you get customers, right? But uh, if you sell something like a lot of B2B and uh, looks like B2C, right? Like, like obviously physical products, if you sell it, sell like bottled coffee or something like that, yeah, you're, you're strictly B2C, but you probably have a B2B wing to get into the grocery stores. And um, so a lot of people will start with one or the other, but you have to kind of figure out what is what is the point of your social platform that you're going to be on? What is your goal with it? What is the outcome that you're looking for? Because if we don't work backward from an outcome, we just start spraying things against the wall and it's scattered. And that's when you don't get results, right? Like we, we talked about niching earlier. It's kind of like niching your content for who you want to reach on, on that platform. And it can change platform to platform. If you're promoting on LinkedIn, you might be much more talking about, um, whatever you're selling from a, from a career standpoint or from a, you know, busy at work, have my coffee, like that kind of thing. Like it can change how you talk versus going on Instagram or TikTok. You might show a lot of beautiful, like lifestyle imagery and, uh, and videos and that are more appealing to the average consumer to go buy it. So there's, there's a, we have to be very, very deliberate when we're marketing um, to not waste a lot of resources and get it wrong, um, which is why, you know, when I was looking kind of, I, I don't, for everyone here, um, I'm, yes, I'm the head of marketing, but I don't always, you know, actually pretty much never do I build the, the programs. Like we, we discuss them and we build outlines together and stuff, but uh, I don't always know exactly what's in it, but I got to sneak, sneak peek behind the scenes at the new social cert coming out. Um, and I, that's why I'm so excited about it because it's, it's, it's teaching platform specific tactics. It's not just like, here's how to do social media in theory. It's going like, how do you do it on LinkedIn? How do you do it on Pinterest? How do you do it on Instagram? How do you do it on TikTok? Like it's going platform to platform so that whatever you decide is best for your business, you can actually go learn from, and it's, and it's not generalists teaching those. Mark went and found people who are specialists at the specific uh, platforms to teach specific tactics. So it's, um, it's going to be, it's going to be a lot of gold in there. Oh yeah. Well, and I think it's, uh, you know, just like we talked about before, like you just can't be good at all of it. Like how would that work? But again, to your point, and, and actually Michelle was talking about HEB does it. And I, I think what social for bigger companies that might not directly sell to the people that are consuming the content, it's support for the brand. So it's saying, yeah, yep. we care about the customer lifetime value, and we're going to support that by essentially doing customer service on all social media channels. And, and actually Goldie talks about that, where she says, you know, a lot of big companies have two Twitter accounts. They have like the public Twitter account, which is more of the marketing. And then they have a customer care one so that people could use Twitter to, you know, immediately get to their yeah. customer care departments. Perfect example of like being creative with what, what is the purpose of the platform that you're on? Yeah. But I mean, for, for most people, it's like, no, just, I mean, it's just a personality base because it's, you know, for marketers, and this is one of the things we say, why marketing professionals are safe is because a lot of our job is just relationship, right? It's, yeah, mm -hmm. we do the strategy. Yeah, we do the execution. But at the end of the day, we're just trying to keep, you know, Bob, the shoemaker from doing something stupid, like cutting his budget because, you know, he's trying to save some money or something. And you're like, no, that's not... <laughs> If you want more money, yeah. you need to spend a little bit more money. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's convincing them and keeping them uh, on the right path. So uh, I think yeah. that being on social is a way to support that. And if you do nothing else than just kind of be human on social, it still could have a huge effect unless because you're selling. Oh, yeah. Or something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that's a good point, too. I, I 
when, especially if you're in a service-based business, like if you, if you're a marketing agency or something or a consultant or a freelancer, um, it's social media is great for that because you can, you can actually get customers from it and you can do like some of the things I was talking about earlier with influencers, how you can, you can like put lead magnet or like we do with digital marketer, we put lead magnets, lead magnets out. We get people back to our email list. We put them in specific funnels that we know are going to be useful for them instead of sending everything to them. Um, but also what you can do is, is use your, you don't have to use social media as a growth platform, as a lead generation platform. You can use it as a relationship builder and a trust builder where even if like, if, if you're a graphic designer, um, you might just use Instagram and post your client work as it, as you finish it and talk a little bit about the project underneath it and what your thought process was. And that's all it is. But then when you're in a conversation with a prospect, you can say, uh, you know, you give your pitch, you say, if you're interested in working with me, here's like, here's a bunch of my work and how I, how I thought through it. And that'll get you more clients probably than, than just trying to use it as a, as a hype platform. Um, so think just back to my point, you know, think creatively about how you can use social media, because there's at least one way you can use it. If you're not using it, there's a way you can. Yeah. Well, and, and again, you're going to have to get more involved in something outside of maybe your typical paths, because that, that was the next topic I want to talk about, which is paid media and the increasing cost of advertising and the uncertainty of, okay, how is this going to work moving forward? Is it going to keep, you know, could people keep their SEO and say their Google ad and their Facebook ad models and expect the same results? Or are those costs going to start going higher because, it's easier for people to run campaigns because the the creatives are easier to generate. The copy is easier to generate. And so now even per, people who don't want to use marketers could still write some ad copy just by asking ChatGPT to do it. And now you're going to increase the pool of people who will market just because it's way easier. Yeah, you don't it's easier. Necessary. Yeah, you don't have to hire a professional. You're not going to be good at it. Yeah, it's easier <laughs> to start, but you're going to lose your money. But uh, if you're not careful, but. Yeah, I well, think well, that screwed up more because those those say, oh, I'll just put the <laughs> highest rate, I'll put max bid, you know. Yeah, there's there's definitely strategy to pay media. Um, I think like so for for me, I'm I'm a pretty bad media buyer. Like I'm not the guy you want like choosing how to set up your Facebook ads account. It will not go well, um, and that's why that's why we uh, work with a freelancer who is excellent at that. And so, um, but he's not the guy I want writing the ads. So it's, um, with paid media in particular, know, know your strengths and weaknesses. Um, if you want to spend any budget, um, that is substantial. Um, but they are recognized are two different skill sets, creating good copy, creating good, uh, imagery, good videos, whatever you need to like make it a good persuasive ad. Um, versus being a good media buyer and can you make the most out of a budget because they're different. Um, and as costs rise, um, what I know, like what, what my strategy has been the past several months is, as uh, costs have been going up is not necessarily adjusting the budget, because I think if you have the budget, if you have an actual like ad budget and you're not worried, like you, you always know when you're doing advertising, there's some risk you're going to lose it. So find out what that number is for you and be okay Like if a couple of months don't go great. Um, but what I've been doing is keeping, keeping the budget, but then scaling back the amount of ads up that we're putting out. So instead of like, let's say we were, we're going to spend $50,000 for a promo launch or something, instead of putting out um, three or four ads for that, and then I'll start for, you know, for $25,000 on that, and then uh, putting... $22,000 into some lead magnets and kind of splitting it. Now it's being really deliberate about what's going to get us our best return. Is it putting all 50,000 for a promo or is it spreading that out across um, a few different things? And so what we've been doing a lot of is, is advertising less things, keeping our budget the same until we really uh, get our, our return on ad spend dialed in on one, on one uh, funnel and then moving on to the next funnel. So it's kind of like when everything's good and money's just flowing in and sales are easy and ads are cheap, it, it's a great time to experiment because you can kind of cut your losses a little bit easier. Um, but when it starts to tighten, just getting more specific and deliberate about what you're going to test and what outcomes you're hoping for, um, and then kind of reverse engineer that, um, you know, test it, adapt, repeat, right? The TAR method, test, adapt, repeat. 
Yeah. So I think, I think the basic principles will continue to, um, you know, kind of guide everything moving forward. But I do think you're going to have to be on top of it because it, it, like yep. you said, it's easy to be like, oh yeah, let's keep on experimenting. And then, you know, a month goes by and you're like, holy crap, uh, that kind of didn't go the way we thought. And now just dial in focus and, and you'll be a lot better off. Uh, we actually do have a question for Mickey, our favorite card. Uh, with your experience working with influencers, do you have any recommendations on how to leverage influencers or strategic partnerships in affiliate marketing? That's a good question. Um, when you say affiliate marketing, are are they? Um... You could just unmute, Mickey. <laughs> or do it. Hi. Uh, there you go. Hi. <laughs> Uh, yeah, could you give me a little more, um, a little more, um, I want to make sure I'm answering the question right about what you mean with affiliate marketing. Yeah, so I have um, a company that I'm working with now who has some affiliates that are doing some affiliate marketing to generate revenue, but they're interested in leveraging more strategic partners and mm. influencers to generate more affiliate marketing revenue. Got it. Yep. Um, yeah, so what, actually, I will, um, what's, uh, does anyone do or do you feel comfortable sharing your email address with me or here? Yeah, I'll share sure. mine. I'll share mine. You email email me, um, Perfect. and remind me, and I'll send you um, a really good influencer playbook for how to do that awesome. for how to leverage. Um, Thank you. Sure, but the um, yeah, it can work really well. the The main thing with influencers is be, uh, and you probably already know this, but be careful paying flat rates for things when you haven't worked with them yet. Uh, it's, it's totally okay to do that if you've already worked with them a few times and you know what they're going to produce, but um, having some kind of, um, basically make it so where you can't lose money if they don't perform. That's the beauty of, of doing partnerships and influencers uh, and affiliates in general, um, is just making sure that it's, they, they either get a sale and then they get a cut or nothing happens. That way you, you're protected and you don't lose your budget uh, on people who, you know, have 50,000 followers, but their engagement is nothing and they bought them and all the, all, all of that stuff that I know you're aware of. Um, so what I would, what I recommend doing with uh, influencers and partnerships is starting with one or two, um, like a slow rollout with it. Um, if it's, is it, is it like a physical product or is it, um, what's the category? No, it, it's a, it's an online coaching application. So it's a mobility cool. coaching app. Cool. Okay. Okay. Um, so is the main goal to get, um, to get users of the app or to get like, uh, and are there, is there a free version or how does that play out? So there isn't a free version right now. They were doing a free trial, but we cut it because the conversion rates were pretty terrible to be honest. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. so they're, they're just wanting to get more users on the app. It's a higher ticket app compared to what's on the market because it involves a lot of coaching online. Yeah. So like their base price is a hundred dollars per month. Great. Okay, so great. That actually makes it easier. That's kind of one of the challenges. Okay. It makes it, it makes it, well, for like influencers, it makes it easier because now you can, yeah. um, you can use that as part of the branding of like, um, I would make sure whoever you partner with, even if they don't currently use the app, make sure they play with it and like get familiar with it on some level um, so they can talk about it um, intelligently. Um, and then, yes, same deal. Just get, give them a cut of everything that they uh, make from it, but start because whatever, if you have a high cost, like it, I don't know how, you know, a hundred dollars a month, it sounds like there's some coaching involved, which means there's cost involved in that. So you can't give too big of a percentage. Yeah. yeah. So be careful on that. But, um, but recurring, um, giving like a recurring, recurring affiliate payout works really well for that. Like, even if it's small, if it's five or 10%, because people like to know that if they drive, um, if they drive a user, now they're going to get 10 bucks a month. That's pretty cool. Um, and that's a lot better than like a one-time payout. It, it encourages influencers to, and partners to stick around and actually do it regularly. Um, cause what you don't want is, is, you know, getting, uh, Kim Kardashian to do it for you one time. I mean, yeah, that'd be great, but it's going to be too expensive. Um, but what you want is people who are willing to actually believe in the product and continue to promote it long-term. Cause anytime you do influencers, um, even strategic partners to, to an extent, it's not really the first time that you see a big return. It's after like six months, you start seeing this relationship being built where people in their audience actually believe them that it's not this, uh, this one moonshot and that they actually use the product. So no, does, that's that, does that help? Yeah. yeah. 
I love that answer because a lot of times when you see the uh, you know somebody who who's signing up for like a hundred affiliate accounts and they're like they're just going to spam everybody or they're going to add them to comment sections or they're going to do some shady crap. Whereas like I mean my experience because I I've run a few affiliate programs we only had like maybe ten percent of affiliates generate more than a dollar. You know it's mm -hmm. yep. it was an insignificant amount and. You know, and what we did at, at on it, we actually we had a affiliate program and then we also did sponsorships and the sponsorships seemed to actually do better where it was just basically like, hey, here's this person. They have a good following. We talked to them. They're cool. They're brand voice oriented. And then we would just send them like I think it was like a thousand dollars a month in product. And it was just like, here's shirts and equipment and supplements and everything. And then maybe it would work out. But, you know, in terms of fitness, that's usually sponsorships were done before um affiliate programs affiliate was always like a nice to have mm -hmm. except for a company called biotrust biotrust had the only i think it was like a 35 percent commission and it was a lifetime cookie and so so all trainers did it and when, when i was at on it we were at 25 million dollars and biotrust which had a horrible branding and it was just the ugliest thing in the world was 125 million dollars <laughs> and it was like <laughs> it was run by five guys because they dialed in their affiliate program so i've always been kind of an advocate of affiliate programs but like you said it's like unless they're using the product they really believe in the product it's not like they're not doing it for the money like they are doing it for the money of course but um they would probably do it anyways which is you yeah know, your that's best a great person yeah. Yeah. Like, and even if they're not currently doing it, once they see it, they love it because they're going to yes. talk about it differently than someone trying to sell. Yeah. And actually in terms of identifying that, you can just look at influencers who are promoting something or talking about something a lot mm -hmm. and then find out if they're affiliate. And if they aren't, then they could possibly, possibly be a good affiliate for your brand because you'll give them money for doing the same thing. So uh, yeah, I like affiliates, but <laughs> like I said, unless they're going to try, try hard, it's the nothing's going to move because only a percentage of what they send is actually going to sell anyways. Yep. Unless you give them custom promos and stuff like that. Uh, that's great. Uh, so let's see, we cover paid media, uh, TikTok possibly game banned. Um, now we can talk about AI. we got 10 minutes left. <laughs> minutes <laughs> Your favorite. Left. It is. Well, it's, it's kind of, it just applies to everything where I'm kind of like, man, you know, because some of the stuff we're teaching in the certs, we try to do more manual. So you really understand, like, here's where the numbers came from, grab from here. And here's where the ideas came from and blah, blah, blah. But, mm -hmm. you know, the the application AI actually cuts everything by like 95%, like the amount of effort that you had to do. Um, so in uh, let's talk, for paid media, have you have you actually seen any uh solutions in terms of AI other than copywriting, of course, but uh, analytics or um analysis yeah a little bit i'm 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 a little slower on anything paid to move over to ai just because i need to know it's going to work um but yeah certainly copywriting i mean that's used across the board um over at you know here at dm for landing pages for facebook ads for whatever whatever we're advertising on um and it's the way I'm describing it now, like I think, you know, there there is fear in the marketing world of it taking over jobs. I'm not seeing that yet. I'm not. I'm, it, I'm sure it will happen eventually. But what I'm really seeing is it's it's taking over like pieces of jobs or roles, um, and and freeing up people to do more um, with the same amount of time, which is cool. Like I know for me, what if I'm making a Facebook ad? If I need to do four variations and I need to you know, I want to get it done quickly. Instead of me trying to write all the hooks and try to brainstorm it all, I can go to Jasper and just say, you know, here, here's my, here's my prompt. I, I need, you know, write, write me 25 headlines to solve this problem. And it'll give me 25, usually okay ones at best. But what it does is it, it short gives me a shortcut of, I can look and find the, the seven that I think are pretty good and or it gives me an idea for something or an angle I wasn't thinking about so it, it'll cut down you know now I can write four ads in 30 minutes instead of it taking three or four hours so that's where it's really sped up for me it's less about like like my job's not going anywhere because I can work faster now like yes. it's a pretty cool it's a pretty cool uh combo I think the for for paid media I think it's going to be pretty interesting because when you think about it, like all the algorithms um, and there's different algorithms for organic social and paid 
and paid social, like they, they run on different algorithms. And, um, and those are, you know, those have been doing machine learning for 10 years already. Like they're, they're basically, they've already been using, um, like the, the, the machine behind AI to build those. So I don't, I'm curious to see if they allow any kind of integrations to, for tools to actually be able to know their algorithms more carefully, or if they're not going to do that because they don't want people gaming the system. Because at the end of the day, it comes down to like, will platforms allow the AI platforms to, to peek behind the curtain or not? Um, analytics, I think is, is, and I think you mentioned that, I, that's where I see the big opportunity in AI is being able to take... Uh, export all my data from Facebook, from YouTube, from wherever, Google, wherever we're doing ads, and then say like, how do I make these better? And just let a tool go, you know, and, and like actually look at like what I was doing and what the results were and how I could give it a 10% ROAS lift. No, I, I love that. Yeah, because I'm so waiting for somebody to come up and talk about the, you know, generative AI for uh, ad copy. Because if you think about individual users, like Facebook knows the preferences. Uh, did we lose? <laughs> we we lost my, we lost my video. We lost your video. Okay, but, good. But I hear you. Uh, I, like, I got it. Like, am I just talking to somebody? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what I was saying was the, uh, you know, generative in terms of like you talked about writing copy and how you get these variations and whatnot. But what if the ad copy was just generated based on the, you know, user habits uh, that the, for the ad that they saw? So if there's somebody who's right. really into horses and then, you know, it rewrites your ad to appeal to somebody who maybe likes the outdoors or likes animals and then incorporates that into the copy. Uh, I haven't seen anybody do that. I'm just speculating and hoping, I think. That's a cool thought. Like, could you, could you take, you know, if you have... Um... 50 different variations of like a customer persona. Could you, could you write one ad, put it in a tool and say, write me 49 others that are similar to this for all these different people. And then push that live straight to wherever you're advertising. Like that'll be a cool. Oh, there you go. James um, knows. Time saver. Albert. Albert AI. AI. Nice. Like I'm going to look that one up. Yeah. I was going to mention in terms of the uh, analyzing data, I did find one that looked really cool. I haven't tried it yet. It's called obviously obviously dot ai and what that does they specifically the example that they talk about talks about how to identify the demographics to eliminate churn so it says okay mm -hmm. here's uh, a retirement home and you know which how can we identify the people who are probably going to leave us in a certain amount of time and it actually yeah. took took all the stuff it was just a spreadsheet took all the spreadsheet and said oh it's this person it's 65 years old they moved in within the last three weeks and actually outlined exactly wow. the people who are going to churn and i was like oh that's helpful uh actually you want yeah. james you want to unmute and talk about albert that sounds pretty cool too yeah i'd love to hear Sorry, I was out firing the smoker up. Nice. <laughs> Heard you guys talking. I was like, I gotta go jump in there really quick. Um, yeah, so there's uh there's a book, it's like marketing AI. It's been out for a little while. It's from the Marketing AI Institute. And I just ran across a part where they talked about uh Red Balloon, which is they do excursions in Australia that people can buy. And they're mostly focused on Australians in Australia. And they were spending about uh, 45000 a month in agency spend. And they switched to this Albert.ai and completely cut out all the agency spend. The AI analyzed all their ads, all their analytics, and then generated, I think it was like 6,500 ad variations to start testing out there. And the, but the biggest thing that they found was there were expats who lived in the UK and the US who were buying these excursions when they would come back to visit. And so it identified a whole new market segment and was able to actually get a lot of uh, return, a lot more. The average return uh, was an 1100% increase and in some cases was up over a 3000% increase. Now, I try to go to Albert.ai and I cannot find any information on them. So I think the book's a couple of years old. The only thing I could find about them other than that was an interview that uh, they did with an Israeli television company. It was too effective. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, no, that's exactly what I'm talking about, where I'm like, if it can identify these areas where you wouldn't think of it, you know, but the actual information is based on real data instead of research and kind of speculation and hope, 
yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and yeah, I think like the use of like first party data is cool. Like you don't you don't have to collect you you don't have to collect actual like user data from them without permission. For example, you can just use what you already know about these people if they're um, like your own customer base with emails that they've given you freely phone numbers have given you freely, uh, location data, just things that are kind of more basic that aren't, aren't necessarily, um, going to upset anybody. Like you can use, you can use that data as opposed to relying on Facebook to give you all the data or TikTok give you all the data that they kind of under the board siphoned without anybody knowing. Um, and that'll be really, um, that'll be received a lot better because people will actually get ads that they want to see and not kind of the pseudo version of what Facebook thinks they want to see, which doesn't always work out that great. Yeah, man. Well, it goes back to the TikTok talk. I think TikTok's the only platform where I saw an ad and I only bought the product because I saw the ad. Like I didn't know anything about them, didn't know about the offer, didn't know, it wasn't even looking for the solution, but it was just so targeted that I was like, oh, well, yeah, I'll buy that. That looks awesome. I didn't even know it was an ad. <laughs> and I'm like, I just want that thing. And then it turned out <laughs> to be an ad and you fill out the form. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's- They got uh, you. You're a marketer and they got you. I know. That's why I'm like, <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm suspicious of everything too. And I'm still like, man, no, they just, they they dialed me in. They marketed me. <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny. Uh, well, thank you so much, Dustin. I think this has been a great yeah, talk uh, talking about social and fitness and paid media and everything else. Uh, and you mentioned our our social challenge coming out next week. Uh, yeah, yeah. Would you would you just briefly? I, I don't mean to turn this into an ad opportunity, but I just <laughs> I'm a marketer, so everyone give me a little bit of a break. Uh, could could you just uh, explain a little bit about the social challenge? Because I'm just pumped about. it. I think it's going to be so cool. Well, you know, I just focused on because so the CERT is enormous, like it, there's so much data in it. So what we kind of realized was that a lot of people just aren't doing any social. And so they they want to do social, they know they should do social, they haven't taken the time, they don't have the confidence to do it. So the challenge kind of revolves around just being active on social. And so what we're going to do is say, okay, let's identify a five, 10 minute video that you've shot. And then we're going to show you how to splinter it into all the different networks and then use AI to actually do it within like minutes where something else would have taken you hours. And then now we aren't going to tell, talk about the strategy, you know, the strategy, the, you know, the nuances of each platform, that kind of stuff. You, you'll have to get the certification and the boot camp, but um, you know, this is to get people rolling, show them that social media is not scary. It's not difficult. And you, you will have to be active. And so we're going to teach you how to do or everybody, how to do that within uh, five days. So it's a five day challenge. So everybody look for that. It's coming yeah. next week. That's super cool. Cool. Well, yeah. Thanks again for uh, having me on. This was fun. Thanks everyone for showing up. Thank you, Dustin. Uh, Michelle, you want to take us out? Uh, sure. So thank you everybody for attending today. Again, of course, thank you, Dustin. I know I sprung this on you out of nowhere, <laughs> but it was really nice to have you on and just kind of introduce you to uh, our favorite people. Uh, but for everyone else, appreciate you coming. Next week, we have Rachel B. Lee. She is the co-founder of Standout Authority. You may know her as the co-founder of Joshua B. Lee's company, because I know we've had him around forever. Uh, but she's going to be talking about branding and, of course, LinkedIn, because I don't know if y'all know, she's amazing at LinkedIn. Uh, I would love to see a conversation between her and Mandy. Uh, but uh, we do have a question really quick before we go out. Yep. Someone wants to know what the software that divides is. What's the software that divides? Is that is that a riddle? I mean, it might be. <laughs> Google. <laughs> no, what was the software that divides all the posts and puts content up for you? Oh, well, oh. that's kind of the challenge. We can't just keep that up. Uh, uh, <laughs> what is it called? Uh, you were talking about it earlier. <laughs> now, nah, here, I'll give it to you. Hang on one second. Uh, now, how to optimize it. You don't have to show up for the challenge, but I'll give you the tool. Here you go. Perfect. Super cool. It's it's uh no, it's really yeah. awesome. And, and they have like free credits and stuff too, so you can play around with it without buying it. Nice. Yeah, I think I mentioned that was my that was my contribution during the uh uh M3. That was it. I said video and then had to explain how to spell it because that's a stupid name. <laughs> that's a horrible name. <laughs> video. Well, on that <laughs> note, <laughs> y'all have a fantastic weekend. Thank you for spending the past hour with us, and we will see you next week. Bye. Everybody. See